Hello and welcome to the Delirium Engine, episode 2. Today we will be getting right down to it, and today I'm also with my new co-host, and not permanent new co-host, but current new co-host, Shoots. Yep. And uh, unfortunately, Swampy won't be here today, as he was called in on an emergency, on, on an emergency. so he can't, uh, he won't be able to make it. With that said, we should just get right down into it. Uh, this uh, stream, for those who haven't seen the first and glorious episode, um, is a conversation about a series of rules that I created when I was in university, and I dusted them off, and took a look at them, and I'm going to discuss them each in turn. There's about seven for GMs and seven for players. We're on the second rule, which we'll get to in a few seconds. So, in this discussion, just to let you know, shoots, mm -hmm. uh, arguments, if we get into any arguments, uh, arguments of it depends on the player base or any, like, rule one or rule zero or whatever it is, I don't remember. Hey, everyone's favorite quote. Yeah, any, any of that nonsense, those aren't arguments, those are the lack of arguments, so please disregard any thinking on that line. Because, obviously, any game works great if everyone agrees that it's a great game that works. Assuming that, yeah, the, the GM is not incompetent, that the players are at least responsible and competent on their own right, is something that we should Yeah, so, so I'm going to ignore that, because that's a game that's... That's a miracle game, and those aren't... They're, those are unicorns, and we don't talk about unicorns here because we don't like them. Um, with that said, though, uh, our today's topic is... The details of your setting are irrelevant, and brooks much tampering. Ah. So, like I said, I am obviously on the side of the details of your setting are irrelevant and brooks much tampering, and shoots here uh, seems to be, uh, well, seemingly he will be on the side of the details of the settings are fairly relevant, and uh, you really should respect them. Well, I find that just like any character that gets written up for the most part, that the fine details of the setting are the things that give it the most, um, well, detail. Uh, it's, to to paraphrase, I suppose, an earlier discussion in the first one, uh, the uh, it's the, the spice, basically, that makes the, the whole uh, meal just taste that much better. So maybe, perhaps, you don't feel that knowing specifically that, say, for instance, we're playing, I don't know, Shadowrun, we'll throw a, number, a name out there. Uh, and you don't care that this guy's got, you know, three data jacks down the side of the right side of his head. And that he is uh, all in the know in specific motorsports. But it could be very relevant to the game. It could make a great amount of detail. And on top of that, it tells people all about that particular NPC and the, the area they're in. Okay. So, uh, let me just go into what I mean by this this rule and then we'll pick up on some of those points I think all right um, first things first when I'm talking about the details of your setting I'm obviously talking about the GM setting uh, are irrelevant you know this is uh, the original words I was gonna use were um, or is stupid or something like that but I don't think that that's true so I had to change the words name to irrelevant um, Unimportant, I think, was also another word that was was used in the original entry. Yeah, mm. unimportant, and that I I, it, I got rid of that because it doesn't. I don't think that that word was clumsy. And um, details are important, obviously, uh, but they're not relevant. Uh, and what I mean by that is, uh, no one cares, or no one should be forced to care. In your player base, whether or not the name of your Grand Wizard is Elminster or Bubble Shoes, nobody cares. And in fact, it's in many ways a sort of a detriment to the game if you have a lot of details that players are forced to remember in order to maintain their interest, or not their interest, their um, engagement in the game. So let me just give a quick example. You know, you have 10 towns in your cluster of, of towns, 
that you call a kingdom in your setting. And each of those towns have weird elven names like Melthar Glass or Whistle Waddle or whatever. All sorts of crazy names. And your players now are forced to remember all these insane names. Now add to that, you know, you have like a deity pantheon of like 66 deities, all with insane names, you know, all with, you know, wacky things. And, and now, you know, by the end of it, you have an unwritten book, or maybe it's written, that you're expecting your PCs to have engagement with. Um, and the re, like, this, you can, you can sort of see by this, this picture I'm painting, that the, these PCs will become confused. Uh, some of them might engage, some of them, you might get the, the odd, uh, uh, just, like, dynamo, who just sucks it all in like a sponge, and he knows everything about your setting, and, 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 you know, those guys are great, but he would be just as happy if you used every, if every name that you used was different, you know, he doesn't care, but he's just going to absorb it. Or same with the other PCs. Like, all those names, all those details, you can you could literally get rid of them. And just replace it with generic township number one. Generic township number two. And the, your pantheon of gods could be law god, heal god, you know, DPS god, god of thufs, you know, god of tanks, you know. It doesn't matter. Whatever. Whatever, whatever pantheon you have. God of the ball of fire in the sky. God of that other ball of fire that's red. You know, god of the moon, goddess of the moon, you know, yeah. So, basically, it's, uh, yeah, okay, you know what, I think I'll, I'll stop on that. If you have any, any points you'd like to criticize on, on there, I think I'll, I'll give you the chance to do that. Well, it's funny because you led me into this with the comment about a, uh, the unwritten book. Uh, while, of course, uh, details, uh, it's like having 66 gods and, and the 10 elven townships of, of halfling opia here, it, is, you know, it doesn't matter, to a degree. But, uh, equally, I believe that uh, the, the concept of just having some quick notes or, or presenting your, your players with, say, um, a, a divine hierarchy. Uh, for example, the setting I recently used, there was approximately, I believe there was 12 gods uh, to be brought up, and I had a quick list, which I pre created a little uh, forum for, uh, for other details as well. It didn't fly as well as it could have. Still, with that degree of detail, it gives them the option to explore if they'd like. If they choose to ignore it, I'm not going to go and put any kind of detriment for it, but everyone will enjoy the game to a different degree. So, I find, though, that if I didn't put that degree of detail into, say, the setting, I didn't name all the towns, I didn't provide, say, a map that gave a visual for the area, I didn't uh, go into detail about the various hierarchies and how their clergy reacts and how uh, what their holidays are and all these fine things, that it would be something that those who, it, who take in all of that information, who actually appreciate it, would... Um, they'd miss it. It would... The whole thing would end up, again, I earlier made mention to cooking, I guess in this particular one I'll use painting. You know, if, if, if I only limit myself to certain tones and certain uh, outlines, I've got a chalk drawing on a chalkboard instead of a grand uh, tapestry I've woven or, or a, a mighty uh, painting I've, well, paint. I, Terminology has escaped me right now. It seems the details in my own words have eluded me. That's okay. But you see where I, I'm, I'm going with that. I, I'm terrible. With uh, with rambling, and, I, and I'm sure my last ramble just now was exactly uh, evidence of this. But uh, I got a couple quick points here. Okay, you know, yep. just just based on what you said there, and we'll we'll go back and forth. So my first question is: you said something that you you made a hierarchy of of gods, mm -hmm. and um, I guess this plays to my point. Uh, you said it wouldn't didn't fly. Why didn't it fly? Well, some of my players uh, were more. Well, first off, my, where I posted it wasn't exactly the greatest and most, most easy resources, and it was done halfway through the game. So that is a foible on my own behalf. But that aside, uh, they tend they found themselves glued to one or two. They didn't seem to care about the greater majority of them. Uh, so to and you know the setting a little bit better than I do. Would you say that the details those details were irrelevant? I'll say they were ignored. I wouldn't say they were irrelevant. <laughs> I mean, so for for example, 
I had, uh, to, to, to quote my, my players, I had one character that was drawn to the god of knowledge, who was equally the god of magic. He decided that this was the one he was going to cling to, and that was fine. They had major encounters with the gods, the twin gods of shadows and, you know, secrets and, and such like that in the earlier part of the game. And then later on, uh, someone had an interest in uh, the god of healing. Now, these all came about throughout the game when people were waiting to come around and do their thing, where they were actually reviewing the details and the information I had left for them. When, for the most part, let's say the first, oh god, what was it, 12 sessions, 10 sessions, they focus exclusively on the god of knowledge and magic. So, it might not have been relevant to start with, but as the game went on and people relaxed and got a little more comfortable, I felt that these details became more and more relevant. Okay. Um, that, that will lead to my next point eventually, but I'd like to just point out mm -hmm. that during this conversation, mm -hmm. you every time you referred to this deity, you referred to him as the god of knowledge and magic, or you referred to another deity as sort of, uh, 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 you know, the twin shadow deities, like one of secrets and one of shadows, yes. you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and you never referred to them by their name, ever. Like, you didn't even say, you know, Kaval, the goddess of secrets. And Cassandra. Or Cassandra, the god of goddess of shadows, the twin deities. Like, his, because I think inherently you realize that those names are irrelevant. And that's the detail. That's a detail. I would, I would dispute that. Uh, because the reason I left the names and details out in this particular instance is that we are doing a, um, a YouTube stream. We're not actually trying to bring all these details to players who are interested in the game. Okay. And as a previous discussion we've had many, many, many times prior to this whole uh, microphone in front of our faces situation, D&D um, &D stories get rather boring to, some, to people who aren't part of them. So I didn't want to get into too much cool. detail on those guys. That's right. And... Maybe that also is part of my point, too, where it talks about how the details of your setting are irrelevant. Like, when you say the goddess of shadows, people can visualize, you know, okay, a goddess of shadows. I get an idea of what we're talking about here. Okay. But if you say Cassandra, eh, people don't see it because that, that's a detail. You know, it doesn't talk about the trope. And, I, and maybe what I'm trying to say with this rule, and, like, I, I know what I'm trying to say, but, like, I, we're trying to, like, figure out the truth of this, I guess. Um, maybe the, the truer statement is that these, these setting entities uh, that we're talking about here, and I, and I touched on like the idea of what setting entities are in the last stream, yes, yeah. you know. Um, maybe it's more important that you deal with them, that you talk about a lot of these things as themes or as, as like a, a, just a, a generic and then, yeah, obviously you paint the picture. Like, people, townsfolk have names, things like that. But I would say as a GM, you, you when you paint that picture, keep in mind that it's not that important. And not only that, um, if your players don't remember it, it's not important either. Even if it's like a 20-year-old setting that you love more than anything, you know, if they can't remember that the god of magic in that setting's name is Thazadry... You know, you shouldn't be unhappy. I feel you know? like that's a shot almost. <laughs> like, no, I, I, don't think, I don't think it, no I can't. That's a tree. Yeah, poor guy. Yeah. But that's that's what I think I'm saying. Is like, it's more, in that case, it's, it's to me, it's more valuable when, when dealing with players new to the setting. Like, yeah, obviously, as time goes on, they might enrich themselves with the setting and then like, they'll, they'll get into the storyline. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they might adopt... Once again, we're getting to this idea of players adopting these concepts and like making them their own. They might adopt these concepts. Um, but until that time, general tropes is probably all that's necessary. You know, do you worship like the, a character will come in cold on a setting and that happens often. I don't know how many there's very few GMs unless they have a solid group. Like and I mean a group they play with every time the same setting, you know, yeah. that knows the, the shit in your setting. Mm -hmm. Swear words, Dan. Um, You're doing that good. knows the stuff. Yeah, that knows the stuff in your setting. Um, and so generally, they'll make a character being like, "Yeah, I worship the god of magic, whatever he is." And you're just like, "Yeah, that's that's X." I will, I will confess that is precisely how the game started. Yeah. So I had someone ask me who the god of magic is. I gave them a name, which was Joliar, and then they like, "Oh, you know, Joliar is my man." There we I, go. And I guess I guess just on that point, just continuing um, the second part of this statement and Brooks much tampering. 
Now, if the player says, no, 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 I don't want to be part of the God of Magic Thazadry. I want my own God with my own ideas. You know, as a GM, I would say it is very important for you to accept that. Because your the details of your setting are irrelevant and brook much tampering. So if they say that their player has a second God of Magic, why are you... Like, what are the reasons why you wouldn't adopt it? Like, unless it... Maybe if it goes against the core tenets of your setting. For example, um, you know, your setting is that there is one God and it's his name is Yahweh, <laughs> You're, right? And you and your characters, like, you, like your player is like, no, 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 I'm playing the God of magic and he's a real God and all, and you're just like, no, you can't. Like this is, like, it goes against the core themes of your setting. Hmm. Like this isn't the details of your setting. This is like, we're playing this setting. You yeah. Know, you know, you know, cowboy necromancer robots. Oh God, yes. In 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 a in a hard fantasy no magic setting is is like the same kind of idea where it's like no, you don't get to be a cowboy necromancer robot in a setting that we're all barbarians and no magic. Like you know, no, you can't use freaking six shooters. You know. Yeah, yeah. Like, we actually. This is this is this is not. This is the kind of thing that we're talking about when it's like th those are not the details. To, to make one small point for anyone not aware where this Cowboy Necromancer robot thing came up, it legitimately happened in a game that, that he had run and I had played in during a Ninjas and Samurai setting. It was a great, it was a great character. It, it, was, was, it was the first cast character. Oh, God. It was, yeah. It was Excellent. something. Excellent. Um, Excellent character. However, I believe that to, <laughs> to segue from that, yeah, let's uh, that actually does lead into your, to your, we'll say, side of this discussion. Uh, yes, he threw something in uh, that was completely not non not with the setting. You roll with it; it w actually ended up working out all right, and the game was enjoyable. So, and not only that, the setting that you loved so much because you tampered with it had become enriched. Well, I do think that uh, when you create your setting, regardless of the degree of details you throw into it, uh, it's it's an amorphous object. It, it always has room to grow and evolve. If the if you were completely uh, stringent and locked it down into a, a set degree uh, of rules. There's no change for deviation. The the player involvement does nothing to change the setting. Well, it's not really the story then that you're trying to weave. Uh, the the players, at, by din of being um, PCs, by being, by being adventurers of note and of a party, should cause the setting to adjust, should alter the, uh, the atmosphere to a degree. Okay. Of course, though, still, I believe that uh, without th those details, we'll still find a way to uh, to exist. See, okay, so now now it looks like we're, we're reaching some sort of consensus. So let's try to shake things up with my next point here about what you originally said. Okay. Or at least the next note that I came in. Yeah. Uh, where do you think the line should be drawn between setting, you know, parts of your setting that are important and parts of your setting that are simply the details? Where is this line? Well, one of the most definitive ones, and it's actually came up most recently in my most recent game, much the, the um, ire of a few of my players, uh, was tech level. Uh, so that is a very distinctive detail. So say for uh, the the thing that came up, and I whoops on a couple times actually, was gunpowder didn't exist. And that meant that you couldn't have matchlocks, flintlocks, cannons, explosives, grenades, none of that. Uh, for slightly personal reasons but also additionally that i found that with them it it muddies things up when it comes to a technical basis i've always found that whenever i had guns in the setting that people would always try to modify them in some way to, to power game a little bit these guys are better than that and i should have known for sure from the start but still um tech level is a very very important detail uh, while, of course, I did just focus on that particular thing that also meant that, say, degrees of clockwork weren't really a thing, um, automatons weren't exactly a thing, so on and so forth. Um, let's see, other details. Uh, hard pressed to think of them on the fly okay, well, here. Let me, let me add one then, yeah. I think. Okay, like, like, we'll, we'll try to build on some solid details, and okay. then from there we'll see if we can see if these are the only ones that really matter yeah so we got tech level i i would say um setting themes are extremely important oh absolutely so like uh, for example the rotting realms which is the setting that that i that i often play in one of the themes is uh decay 
or forgetfulness or or you know rot uh, by dint of the nature of the setting. Mm-hmm. Um, it just shows like low magic as well. Yeah, and that's the tech level too, like magic oh, tech yes, level. Yes. So it's like you know, there are things that that stop that. Or, or another theme is struggle in the Rotting Realms, and not just like epic struggle. I mean like despondency struggle. Like you struggle with what your character is because the setting is very cruel, and you find you as a player. Um, becoming depressed <laughs> because <laughs> because that's far i think that's also part of my gm style um well, is the players become despondent and they feel that they can enact no change on the setting but which, you know they, uh, they can never save the world but that's the point part of the themes of the setting is you can't save the world uh, amusingly enough i think that actually uh that puts you in my camp on the earlier detail about um brooks much tampering your setting does not brook much tampering because you can't solve the world problem and your changes end up decaying and rotting away yeah well in my defense not like with that specific setting um the that's a core theme of the setting like there there are certain sort of things like solid blocks in place um but if a if a character wanted to be an outsider there are like i as a i've put storyline things in the setting or just like I'll roll with it and be like, yeah, sure. You, you know, you're, there's an issue. There's, there's like, say you wanted a god, a different god that wasn't in the pantheon. It's like, yeah, great, do it. It's yours. Okay. Uh, you know, are you from another plane of existence? Like you're an old character from another world. Oh, great, you're blip. You, you blipped in from another multiverse. It happens. You know, so be it. Even though one of the major themes of the setting is there's no connection to the other multiverse. Like there's no demons or devils or any of that nonsense. Yeah, no blood uh, wars. As I recall, there's two ways in and. Yeah, there's there are some ways in and out, but like th- yeah. that's irrelevant. The point is, is no, that that all that stuff is shot out. Nobody's a Burke. Nobody goes to, you know, the the, the Queen of Pain has no power here. Mm. You know, bah- Bahamut can't come in. You know, no. Yeah. Okay. All right. You know, if you if you worship a different god from a different plane, you might get power by dint of your faith, but not because that god can show up. No, because you, faith powers magic, not god specifically in that particular instance. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, again, a setting. De- but that's, that's, that's a, a major. That's, that's a major, major theme, theme yeah. right? I guess. Um, uh, well, I guess that this puts, puts it down to the the argument that we had to divide then specifically what is the difference between themes and details. Well, what's a th- well, what's a theme of a setting? Like the themes of a setting would be like you know, um, you know, well, you know level, say Dark Sun, yeah. like the the setting Dark Sun. Yeah. Um, you know, Which you're I'm in a sure. desert. Yeah. All right. So. And and the idea of that is like the people who play that, like the people, the PCs. Part of the theme of that game is you have struggled to become even alive <laughs> at yeah. level one. Yeah. So you are stronger than any other character in any other setting because you are, you know, you, you're that strong. And, and like, you, achieving, attaining water and all these things are important in that setting from what I remember. Of it. Yeah, drank the tears of your enemies and, and the lamentations yeah. of their women. And so all that. You, wouldn't, you wouldn't change that by allowing someone to play, uh, like, some Hawaiian tourist... Who's like real like you know? Hey, buddy, you know like have a canteen, endless canteen of water, you know all sorts of goofy stuff. Like it would totally mess with the yeah, things of the game. Of endless or once water again, watches. cowboy necromancer robot in your dark sun setting. You know, um, I don't know. I would give give him a skeletal horse. I'd play a little bit of uh, uh, what was that song again? Uh, uh, some nice of Sidonia. Oh, I got, yeah. Okay, right off. off but, but okay, then <laughs> even then, like I guess, I guess that like if if the GM was really fluid with it and and could like work it in, like just work it into that 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 I'm making like a like a molding clay motion. Work that cowboy necromancer robot into the dark sun setting. Sure, I, I, you know, I guess that works too. Like if if you can find a way to work it in so it doesn't completely destroy the themes it's of fun. the game. To, to, to put a little bit of a fun little spit on that, you molding clay as your perspective. The fun, the, the the angle I'm looking at here is more like a, a chef in a kitchen who's received a uh, an addition from some random guy, being like, "Yeah, can you put ketchup on my uh, filet mignon?" Yeah. It's well, like, mm. I, I think the rule implies uh, that no setting is a filet mignon. That <laughs> everybody can put ketchup on their filet mignon. Well, I don't know. That's, that's, where, we, <laughs> that's where we get into the details again. Well, this is why I'm saying the line is. So maybe, okay, maybe, right. maybe like the themes. Yeah. The themes can brook tampering too, I guess. But I guess you can only go so far. Like I know, I know the tech level. I can see that being a, a major thing, unless that's the story itself. 
You know, um, you know. Actually, I think that I'm really th- I, I, the whole time we've been we've been chatting here, I've been really kind of trying to hammer out other things that I don't find, I find too flexible. Tech level is probably the one and most critical one that I can really even get then. To somebody who goes outside of that tech level—that's a story on its own. Well, um, yeah, so which is uh, in fact another rule uh, uh, for players. Uh, but we'll get into that in another episode, of course. But um, uh, but I mean, like you know, set the, we've already said that the number of say deities is flexible. Uh, you could be from uh, obviously when it comes to player backgrounds, if they just make up a town that you don't have on the map, you're gonna have to roll with it. I, it thinking about it, actually, even the tech level could brook some tampering. Like you can always ex- you know expand the setting to be like, oh, okay, well if you guys want to play with guns, you know, let's let's move this thing. We did it with the rotting realms. Oh, no, we did. We did. The Rotting Realms was a fantasy setting, and then we made it this oil punk setting. Well, to and be fair, now I'm thinking a... about making it a dis- like a post-apocalyptic setting. To, to like... be fair, each one, <laughs> while based off of the same name, is itself a separate setting. Except they're not, because the themes are the same. Well, the feel not... is roughly the same. Like it's a little bit different, but not really. The only difference is you got it, guys with AKs rather than guys with long swords. Uh, or, or spears, and you know that you can throw a grenade instead of throwing a flask of alchemist fire. Mm. You know, <laughs> it's the same thing. However, there, <laughs> I, th- I believe at the creation of the game, there should be a static um, expectation. I mean, for example, if you were to take, say, um, D twenty modern as a system, and then they take the standard setting of modern day, you know, Earth. And then you wanted to also merge the uh, goblinization of Shadowrun uh, into it uh, at a later point. And then now that you've done that, you, the world gets nuked. Now we're walking around in like, the, the Fallout style verse, you know, but slightly like 30 years further into the future. And I'm a player in this game and I want to play a former time god. Oh, do we need to bring that one up? No, uh. but like, <laughs> but, but now suddenly, like, I, I'm, I'm now an obtuse character in your now painted setting do do you think and uh, this gets me to the next point like i might even cross out this like solid fluid chart that i'm building here because it might be all bunkum like the rule might be prime like it, it might be legitimately you know you know set in stone here you know if your themes aren't strong enough to support new player like uh, some player's wacky idea like yeah obviously like quacky ducky ideas like a hamburger elemental riding a flying rubber ducky might be really stupid um but uh, it's like the greatest mental image ever actually yeah uh, the hamburger elemental has stuck with me i had an argument once I think and it's- it, it was beautiful but um uh yeah you get this hamburger elemental flying a giant rubber ducky you know the gm can just be like no like this my themes are not strong enough to deal with your nonsense cartoon character but but in most cases you know a gm could probably just be all like yeah you know like they're, they're a little bit of negotiation might might be able to like mold it you know you know, work the character into the clay that is that setting uh and, and once again then that's that's the part of brooking much tampering you know you know if if enough players have enough stupid ideas and we're going to call them stupid because we're assuming everybody wants to play a rubber ducky. You know, maybe you just say, okay, well, we're playing a fun game this time. You know, this is not going to be freaking game canon for the setting, but everyone's going to enjoy the game. And, you know, yeah, it, it's going to be a good time. You know, maybe that's just, you know, the way it's going to have to go in that, in that particular campaign. Um, and, and you can keep your setting, but you, you can just be like, yeah, the, the, the last game was nonsense and we don't have to worry about it. But the, the, the successfulness of the game will will take priority over my beloved setting. And that's the point of this rule. And I think I think even I, <laughs> who wrote the damn rule, didn't quite realize the the, the how how set in stone it is. Like I'm just staring at this rule right now and thinking about it. It's like, no, you know, it really what it's saying is the successfulness of your game is more important than or the successfulness of your of your characters is more important than the stringent um you know uh, uh, uh the codex that is your setting i guess i think one thing that needs to be said above all else and i think is actually kind of implied somewhat in the in this particular rule is that without the game without a game occurring 
uh, your setting has no value. It is literally it's a book on a shelf that's not being read. So one thing that should be considered when actually putting forth your setting in the idea of running this game is that you're going to need to work hand in hand with the players in uh, determining what parts of this setting are going to stay and go, I guess. Uh, obviously, the details that you bring to the table are important if they don't feel like adjusting much or if they feel like let's be not being as quite silly. If you want to be, if you step forth, guys, I want to run a very serious and uh, solid game. Details therein become a lot more important. But if someone's like, but I want to fly to the moon on a rainbow unicorn that's, you know, sitting with a Pop-Tart cat, then... And you say, well, I guess that's happening. You've just therein defined your setting with a different, a detail that was brought up after the fact. Uh, yeah, okay. So that that's where we start getting into the, like, the GM, the band hammer, right? And, and, and the, I guess, one, it would probably be player consensus would have to be the thing in this case where it's like, okay, guys, you know, I talked about it last time in the pregame. You know, we're all playing characters, you know? If everybody's all like, let's all be pirates, and the other guy's like, yeah, but I'm going to be a sky pirate with a spaceship, and they're like, wait, what? We are not. We don't want to play sky pirates with spaceships, and you got one obtuse player being a sky pirate with a spaceship. You know, you might have to call that player out and bring him down. Like, bring mm -hmm. him down a bit. Like, yeah, I understand that this is the character he wants to play, but he, that's the character all the other players don't want to play with. Well, and, it, and I guess if you get a 50-50 split... On that, on uh, that actually. I'll let you go. The, well, in, in the most recent game I ran, uh, we've had, uh, it was a very varying player base. I'm not going to get into the minutia of it, because as the title, the details are, you know, uh, irrelevant. But um, there was a player who had a very uh, specific backstory for their character that a lot of the other players found a little abrasive. Uh, so, to roll with that, um, I decided to adjust it a little bit. I didn't obviously... Uh, the character is, is outside of my purview as a GM. Uh, and in case we haven't... Uh, it's going to be discussed probably in a future show, I believe. Uh, but um, whereas they had these, these, these demons and ghosts and all these things that were, were haunting them and they were the, the angry loner, as you mentioned in the last show, um... I had an alternative that would make it so that they had like a little bit of trauma. They had some some damage, and these ghosts weren't real. These these this demon wasn't real, and just was some some part of their psyche, which made it flow with the game a little bit more. But still, gave credence to the character's damaged backstory aspect. Um, therein, they were able to play because I I know that you and myself both hate saying no to players. Uh, having myself mostly because I've been on the, the receiving end of no when I was learning how to play when I was new and uh, You because you've seen witness to that and what it's done to people but I I, I hate the GM Van Hammer as a personal aspect Still it, it does bear some relevance sometimes you have to there has to be a point where you say no Okay, so so the, I wrote a little piece here just just while you were talking and yeah. I was listening to what you're saying uh, this might be kind of a, like an addendum to what this rule is, but like, so, so once again, we were talking about a, a pregame. Yeah. So the pregame, it seems in these first two rules has, is very important, mm -hmm. like ridiculously important. Um, I, I would say your setting, like you as the GM are a representative of your setting hmm. and the players are a representative of the things they want to play. And the pregame between the GM and the players is a negotiation on behalf of their desires to play and your setting. So, for example, you've got four guys who all want to play Dragon Slayers, right? Or, sorry, of four, of four players, you've got three guys who want to play Dragon Slayers and one guy who wants to play a Malkavian vampire from Dark, World of Darkness. <laughs> like, okay. Okay, just like... All right. You have the one up two sky. You're so always going to. The, the, you know, and the setting is a fantasy Dungeons and Dragons setting, right? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you would negotiate. Well, first of all, the players have to figure out... Like, the, the player's story um, needs to be determined, like, what they want to do in the pregame. And so figuring out what the player plot is, as we sort of discussed in the last episode. Hmm. So the players have to come to a consensus. Uh, this is another one of the rules, I think, that we'll get into. Yeah, about, it's on the player side, I believe. Player, yeah, it's on the player side. Yeah. Um, 
But basically, players should come to a consensus about what they want. And then the GM as a representative of the setting that the players want to play in. Mm -hmm. Right? It, it, he's the one who has to negotiate either tampering with the setting or tampering with the characters. So, I would say take the path of least resistance in order to make both work. So, for example, you want to play a Malkavian vampire in this dragon slaying campaign. Well, why don't you just say the Malkavian vampire is a dragon slayer and just everyone's great. And our setting... You know, let's assume it goes against the setting and saying this, there's no vampires. So it's like, well, can can we say that he's not a vampire? Well, no, I want to be a vampire. It's like, okay, well, what is a vampire? Let's look into what exactly we're talking about here. You know, where where do we draw the line? He's been cursed by a witch or something. Now yeah, he's got a feast know, of humans. Yeah. You know, who knows? Like, would you settle for cannibal? Would you settle for whatever? Like, what exactly do you want out of this vampireness? And if it, I guess, if it becomes too egregious, like too egregious, like he just wants to make people crazy and act like a, like a clown, um, then you'd have to give the ban hammer to it because the negotiation has failed. Precisely. But otherwise, it's just a matter of, like I said, working it in, like almost like like working a new clay into a block, right? Just just work it in and hopefully it, it works out. And if all the players are like, no, I'll let him play the Malkavian vampire, and you're just like, well, the setting doesn't really allow it. Uh, once again, just don't worry about it. Don't make it canon, and just everybody have a good time. Yeah. The um, looking at again this rule once more, uh, I believe that a single word exchange would actually uh, cover that entire thing. Uh, instead of tampering, we'll say negotiation because it's going to be a sit down between the players and the uh, and, and the GM. Your setting, like like the way that you've described it, is actually a very interesting uh, turnabout, because uh, having it sit down at a, at a, a, a meeting table and, and hammering out details, almost like a, co a contract, one would say, uh, towards your setting versus their characters, uh, is um, I think spot on. Uh, this is what happens every time. Uh, most of the time, I find that proposing the setting uh, is where you it's, it's it's the hook for the, for getting the game started. You propose this setting, you give them a little detail about the world, or, or if, if they already know it, fantastic, you just say, I'm going to run uh, Rotting Realms, and bam, you've got your player base. They then will make their characters, and with that, and, and it's, I I would almost dare anyone who, who listens to this, or anyone on the internet, to, to tell me that they don't have players that will try and stretch the setting a little bit, try to fit something in that's a little bit outside the curve. Lord knows I do. But God knows you. <laughs> I bring, Rick. I bring, I bring all sorts of deities and horrible monsters and things like that. I, almost every time I build a character, I build an entire uh, uh, organization behind the character. And oh. then I'm just like, here you are. I have this character I want to play. Please shoehorn this giant organization behind it. Yeah, and, and I'm just like, I guess it's in there. <laughs> and the, the the funny bit is that. The, the degree of details and plausibility that you do when you do so makes it impossible to say no to almost. Well, that's not true. Well, well you can always say You no, can always like, say no, but then the question of why comes up. Yeah, well, that's the is, first question I asked. Then that is the reason that people are a little afraid of you when you make a character. Well, thank you. <laughs> Oh, it's like, uh, uh, actually, it, it was funny. Just to go on a tangent that might be interesting. Um, I, I'm basically, I built a character that's exploring sort of the, the outer reaches of druidic magic, right? And <laughs> I uh, out, out of the game, like this is not, I'm not taking up game time with this, but I was thinking about it because I'm playing a, a female character. And, and I'm like, okay, well, I'm sort of a barbarous druid. And I asked the GM, I'm like, okay, if, I, if I'm pregnant, and I cast Polymorph for I Wild Shape, what happens? And is it possible for me to lay a human egg? Or something like that, right? Like, can I... Am I capable of doing these things? And, and the G <laughs> was just like, please stop. <laughs> this is horrible. <laughs> this is one of those things that you sit there, and if you were the G, you'd be like, that's interesting, let me think about that. Where anyone else starts pulling out their hair and reaches for the, the whiskey. <laughs> All right. I, so I, the long and short of the conversation, we started like we started trying to figure out what magic spell we can use to produce a human egg, and, and like he was saying that it was close to clone, but I was saying it's closer to raise dead. And I, I was put, saying it should be like level five. Hey, it doesn't matter. The the point was, it's, it's this is the kind of nonsense that like everybody's got one, and it just happens that I'm one of those, and and like yeah, mm -hmm. you know, I'm I'm 
I'm pretty thorough when it comes to my nonsense that I try to bring and add to this. I bro I tamper with people's settings. Well, you do have your master's degree in uh, dungeon uh, dungeoneering. Oh here. Jesus! Uh, yeah, I, I apologize once again for that. That was uh, uh, I think that was pretty cringy. So I, I'm I'm like. I was listening to it again. I'm like, oh my goodness. I it, think I was pretty nervous. And I was just like, why are people listening to me? Well, let's give me some credential. Yeah, fuck off. Excuse my language. <laughs> no, that's... Credential. I don't think it was the credentials bit. I just think it was a commentary on how much money we wasted at university. Yeah, yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, I don't use that computer science knowledge. <laughs> well, I do. That's not true. I use it a lot, actually. Well, yeah. But yeah. I, I certainly don't get paid to use it. God. Uh, <laughs> and art <laughs> isn't a degree that you get for money. <laughs> no, 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 it's not. It's so you, yeah. Let's not even get into that topic. Oh, but either either way, a tangent, a tangent uh, has 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 occurred. So okay, well, so what we basically, we, I think we've come to a sort of consensus here, and anything else is just going to be circle, like a, a circle jerk. Um, really, that's the visual you got to put on it, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Um, I think, yeah, like, so, on, once again, um, this rule, I think, is, is pretty solid on its own. Maybe Brooks much negotiation, but the tampering, the tampering rule, I think, like, the word tampering is fine, because it's, the idea is, I think at the end of the day, you should be more flexible with your setting than the players need to be with their characters. Yeah. You know, once... I, I understand Necromancer Cowboy... If you got something to say about that, great. Uh, Necromancer Cowboy Robot, you can shoehorn into your setting. You know, you can find a way to make it work. You know, you just, you know, make them ancient, make them come out of a tomb one day, and, you know, it doesn't matter. Like, you could have figured it... We could figure something out. Because the setting... Dungeons and Dragons settings are supposed to be really rich. Hmm. And... Putting these, like, crazy, wacky, bullcrap ideas, you know, in, in the moment, sound clownish. But it, with a little bit of creativity, you can usually turn these into very enriching ideas. Like, you can distill them down into good themes. So your, your ca necromancer cowboy robot could become, like, you know ancient creations from a lost age of wizardry and you've su now you've created an ancient you know an elder you know uh, uh uh civilization that's fallen and you've just enriched your setting with like freaking cybermen basically like there's tombs now of cybermen underground or whatever like you could have done all sorts of things and that's just because somebody wanted to play something ridiculous well exactly now the one thing that um and that i know that um you've experienced this when i was uh, running previous games is my setting, while I do have a lot of details for what has been fleshed out, the lion service creation has actually come from uh, players tampering with it. Uh, for So in the most recent uh, aspect, we did more of the um, Asian continent. We explored that a lot. We hit some areas of what would be uh, comparable to South America. And all these things I had to kind of come up with based on where their travel arrangements ended up going, what their preferences were, which wouldn't have happened, I guess, without player... Um, will say interference for the lack of a better word and it has added quite a lot to the campaign world now the, th the one thing though to keep in mind uh, and where you were commenting earlier uh, when I was uh, you know if I had something to say on the topic you it comes down to in the end we're a bunch of people sitting around a table talking at each other where it's going to be I, in my ideal player base, somewhere between like five and seven players, versus myself on the negotiation table. And while as a GM, and we're not going to admit, like, oh, I guess I am mentioning rule zero and all the other junk, uh, have a lot of power to work with, in all essence, the players are where the story comes from in the first place. And I have to be, you do more flexible with them than yourself uh, to, to permit them to do things. And having, having, one person change five to seven other people's characters uh, is a very difficult task and generally not something that is going to be too well widely accepted. Yeah, but mo I, I would say that most characters don't produce the kind of details that that ruin your setting. Like, it, it, yeah. how do how do I put this? Like, generally, like when I when a bunch of people sit down to play, like you know, I'm sure there's the odd exception who has like 35 pages of backstory and he wants you to incorporate that into his setting. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, word for word, and you just tell him, uh, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but you straight up, friend, I can't remember all this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, 
but most people will just they play on tropes right there's like i want to be a healer you know i worship the god of healing you know is there a god of healing it's like well no can, can there be one okay or maybe the god of protection will work that sounds good too you know who's the holy who's the christian god you know insert insert christian god uh, uh trope he you know killed many new Paylor, Mafim, you know there's all sorts of them they're everywhere yeah. um yeah, every se every campaign has something, you know. Not Samoon, but man, boy, howdy, we could wish it to be. Not that anybody <laughs> knows what that character is, but it doesn't matter. The point is, is um, delicious gut spark. Yeah. Um, and, and additionally, um, something I thought about halfway through here, uh, it's on the notes um, about the details. Uh, leaving some details out, uh, actually, I found has drawn uh, player interest. Uh, for example, uh, now no one no, 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 here is going to know what this reference is, but uh, a certain Wendell Wilkinson uh, was a, uh, he ran a, he was an NPC who ran the guild house in one of the games that we play, The Rotting Realms. There was almost no detail on him other than he was a rather you know, nervous man who had a skull cap, and that was, that was his armament. And from that, the players decided he was a great super samurai, he was a grand fighter, his... No one saw his blade move in any cleave people in half. We found this attachment to this NPC due to all these uh, details that were non-existent. And rather than be like, no, he's just a regular guy who's like an accountant. Uh, Bryant here has, uh, or McCallicare here has decided that he um, was... Uh, oh, look at that. Yeah, keep going. I, I screwed up. I lost my momentum. But just decide, you know what, I'm going to roll with it. Sure, whatever you guys think is going to happen. I never said one way or the other if that was all the case. Yeah, so just, just to interrupt um, and sort of wrap that up, like, I ran that game with Wendell Wilkinson. And when I originally created Wendell Wilkinson, he was just a guy. He was not a guy who was secretly a supreme samurai or like had all of these great powers he was a guy who spoke like this he he was droopy dog with a sword and i didn't think he had a sword oh yeah he had he had he had basic adventuring gear he had like a short sword and a medium shield and he had like one of them like skull caps yeah he doesn't wear cap. them all the time but he had them like he was a mercenary and so everybody just thought everybody just assumed he was this god tier character because he was just so like all right everybody let's get together and guess what because the details of my setting were irrelevant and they brooked much tampering wendell wilkinson went on to be you know a transcendent character over multiple games run by multiple people because just because i said okay guys i guess he's a god king you know, he's... Whatever you said happened to him, that's what he did. You know, if, if he slayed a hundred dragons, probably. Maybe he slayed less, maybe slayed more. We don't know. But the fact is, is he's a dragon slayer. He does all these things. You know, he fought gods and won. Like, who knows? Like, whatever. It doesn't matter. He's Wendell Wilkinson. You know, stare in awe at his might. And the setting was enriched as a result. And not only that, not only the setting, but... Subsequent settings in other games well, were enriched simply because I didn't stand my ground on a character I had originally invented to be Droopy Dog with a sword. Oops. Just, just, I think that's an excellent place to sort of close the, the conversation. Uh, unless you have something final to say. So let's go with closing remarks. Alright, well... I will have to confess that um, making the setting a little more malleable is probably more desirable. Uh, don't want to have your steel too too firm, otherwise it snaps, right? But uh, no, you know what? I got nothing else. I think I think you want me over on that one. Okay. Well, it, it's interesting. I'll, I'll say my bit, I guess, at the end here is um, I, unlike the last rule. The last rule I was very much a hundred percent firm on. This one I was slightly less uh, 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 solid on, just because, you know, I, I, I've i built settings, I've put, you know, blood, sweat, and tears into remembering, writing down, all of these things. And maybe the setting is my fetish for a while, like, it's, it's, it's the, it's that thing that I hold sacred, but 
thinking about it over the course of this conversation, I, I think I was of the right mind when I wrote this down back in the day. Maybe I just degenerated a bit and it, I was just a genius in university or who knows what. But uh, yeah, I think I think University Bryant was right when he wrote that down. Um, you just talked yourself that time. Well, you yeah, okay. Uni it. University McAllicar <laughs> <laughs> was right. Whatever. Yeah. Roll it on. Whatever. They'll find out anyway. It's not that big a deal. Takes five seconds, yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So, I think that that's, I, like I said, this, this conversation was less a debate and more an exploration, which I think helped solidify it. Yeah, be malleable. You know, don't, your setting isn't that important. And, in fact, the game's success is more important than your setting. And, and, like, the only way the game can be successful is if the players and the GM all have fun. So just like loosen up GM, like roll roll with your necromancer, cowboy, robot, time lord, Malkavians, and and just try to have them enrich the setting, you know. And if the players make up some nonsense and you think it's funny, well, just roll with it. You know what? Uh, the coolness will come out in the distillation after the game is over, hmm. <laughs> when you tell the story uh, with some of the details stripped off. And with that said, uh, I'll just say that this was an excellent conversation. And I wish Swampy was here. He would have added something to it. But I'm glad that you were here as well. Because mm. if you weren't here and Swampy wasn't here, I don't know if I had done this episode this week and I would have had to do something else. It was a heck of a blizzard, but whatever. A blizzard? Just a blizzard? Not today, but yesterday, man. It was yeah, brutal. Yeah, it was a blizzard yesterday. <laughs> so, um... I guess uh, that's probably going to be it for this episode. Next week's episode is uh, System is the Rule, is Rules for GM, Episode 3. System implies setting. Choose wisely. So, on that note, everybody, you all take care and have yourselves a great night.